Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches. Welcome. We're pleased you've joined us for Encounter, a program brought to us by the Broome County Council of Churches and encouraging us to be in conversation with and among our faith communities and the greater community. We're glad you've joined us. I'm Jan Marcy, pastor at Endwell United Methodist Church and uh, one of the hosts of Encounter. We're actually today continuing a conversation that we began last week about our two different faith traditions um, that practice uh, celebrations in the month of December, the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah and the Christian celebration of Christus, Christmas. And today, uh, Rabbi Barbara Goldman, Goldman Wartel is joined uh, with Barb Krungold who is a member of two congregations. And we're very pleased that you're with us today, Barb, to talk a little bit about how you and your family celebrate two different faith traditions this month. Would you kind of start us off by uh, talking a little bit about how uh, you and your husband, Alan, brought two traditions together? Well, the, um the guiding rule that we always had was that you celebrate your own holiday and you honor the other person's holiday. So the, the, I would get fully into celebrating Hanukkah, Passover, everything with, with Alan. And likewise, he would be helping me, you know, when do you want me to bring the, the tree down from the, from the attic and I'll help you put the tree up <laughs> okay. and that type of thing. Be, for, and it's be, so that I could have the enjoyment of my holiday and they, and our son is being raised Jewish, but he's always sort of participated in that same concept of, mm -hmm. um, you know, honoring my holidays. And of course, as a kid, it meant that, you know, if you have a Jewish set of grandparents and a Christian set of grandparents, you make out like the proverbial bandit when you are growing <laughs> up as far as holiday gifts. Sure, sure. Well, um, were there tensions as you tried to bring these two um, traditions together or there were particular challenges as not tensions. The challenges would be uh, when the holidays overlap. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love it when, 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 you know, because of the lunar calendar, the Hanukkah is going to be at a different time. Although this year they do overlap. They do don't overlap. They? <laughs> you know, so I love it when Hanukkah is early in December. So that way I can do my entire house is, is it looks like Hanukkah. It's Versus. got the ha Hanukkah decorations, the Hanukkah linens, you know, the whole, everything is that way. Right. Um, if the holidays overlap, then it divides up for for the room, and so there will be possi there will be a Christmas tree in the living room, and there will the dining room will be have the menorahs and the dreidels and stuff like that on display. Mm -hmm. And you know, when when Franklin was little, there would be th those moments where you said, "I just gave him a little piece of something as his fourth day of Hanukkah." tiny present of it, the eight days of Hanukkah, and it's Christmas Eve. You know, he's going to get, he, got, he just got this, he lit the candles, we're now going to be eating Christmas Eve dinner, and then he's going to be opening his stockings. <laughs> you know, so, so it would be, it was a little strange that way, you know, when, when, they over, when they overlap. On the other hand, I never had to go through the whole routine about telling the truth about the big jolly guy with the beard, because we <laughs> went right from the, you're Jewish, you, you, Santa does not visit you, your parents visit you. <laughs> and you will not say that your parents buy gifts to any of your friends until they are at least in third grade. And he was, he was cool about that, so. Yeah. Has it caused him um, difficulty with his peers to, uh, to not have Santa in his worldview? I, I don't think <laughs> so, because, you know, he still, you know, he understand, you know, he just understood from the get-go that Santa was the, the spirit of Christmas. And my, my work schedule when I was working was always much more fle flexible than my husband's. So for all of Franklin's elementary school years, up until I think sixth grade when he actually had a Jewish, there was one Jewish person on the faculty, I was the one who came in and did the whole presentation ah. on, on Hanukkah to all of the kids because he was probably the only Jewish kid in his school. And so... Um, and yet... I know you from singing in the choir at Tabernacle United Methodist Church all those years. And that's, <laughs> that, that's the thing is that I know there are a lot of couples when, when they decide, especially after they decide which way their, their, their children are going to be raised, that the, um, 
I don't want to say odd man out, but the person whose, whose religion is not going to be the dominant religion, uh -huh. they tend to become the person who goes to church on Christmas and Easter. And, uh -huh. you know, they, they sort of pull back from things. Whereas I have remained active in my church and I go, to, I go every Sunday. So weekends were long when we were going to temple every Saturday morning because there was religious school and I was going yeah. to church every, every Sunday. And I sing in the choir. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that what, what, what was happening is I was going to temple every, every week mm -hmm. with my guys, and they would come on Christmas Eve and oh, I see. Christmas, Christmas Sunday or whatever, whatever was going to be the big music day, and on Easter Sunday they would do right. that, and they would be, you know, and my parents, and you know, my, my mom's still around, and that would be her, they would come right. with her. But that's how it always worked, is I sort of doubled up on my religious attendance. And and they came, they came on the, the big holidays for, for me. And it was mostly, I think, just because they enjoyed the music. You know, I mean, I was never sitting with them. I was always up in the choir loft, as you said. So. Well, it, I think it raises some interesting um, ways interfaith families do negotiate this. And one of the things you, you talked a little bit about was um, which of the faiths is more dominant in the actual practice of a family's um, families traditions um, and it it has to be difficult to hold those in balance um, you can easily see how one could could dominate depending on who was most invested in in their tradition couldn't you I think part of it could possibly be you know with my at least my familiarity with other um, mixed couples in our at our congregation I'm the local I'm somebody who's local and so I grew up in local in congregations and mm -hmm. was established in a local congregation right. here prior to my marriage. Mm -hmm. So I think that could possibly make a difference on how much you a person would say, well look, I'm still going to church every <laughs> Sunday yeah. because you always have as <laughs> right. opposed to maybe somebody who moved in from another right. another area. Right, or or hadn't or who hadn't, or hadn't been, been as and, regular. And so had or uh -huh. hadn't been regular or you know, hadn't been associated, you know, lifelong with a you know, congregation right. locally. Right. Well, it does raise um, the, the issue that it must be different for different couples um, oh, yeah. and different families, um, and that there must be a lot of variation in how people um, do do this. <laughs> well, that was one of my concerns even in having this program, because I think that uh, for anyone to say, I have the answer for you on what it should be for your family is not right. having any sensitivity to the fact that every family is different and it's not only the religion and the faith but it's also the family traditions and the cultural traditions and so many things whenever two people come together to create their own family and their own household they're always as a negotiating and deciding what is it going to be in your home right. as you established from what was in your parents homes or whatever wherever you were living prior and so there is always some give and take on that um, but when you come from two different faiths, I think, or two different ethnic groups or whatever, sure. there is more to have to explore and I think more intentional um, deliberation has to take place um, because it can't just be whimsical, oh, it'll just come as it comes, but it needs Perfect. to be something <laughs> that um, it really, I think, can test the foundation of your relationship, but also help you with learning how to negotiate many different things in life because we have to do that in our families all the time. Um, and <laughs> I've if noticed we, that. <laughs> yeah, but if we decide that we're going to do certain things, our children don't always program the way we want them to. <laughs> so if we decide we're going to do this and you're going to say this here and you're going to say that there, they may not. Yes, exactly. Um, and so we have to be prepared and I think the congregations or communities of which you're a part have to be aware that we are going to have children in our congregation potentially in our religious schools who are observing more than one holiday, right. at least in their homes or, or in their grandparents' homes or aunts and uncles' homes. Um, and they probably will be going to some other houses of worship with right. other members of the family or friends. Right. And so I think we um, also need to know enough to be able to help to prepare them. Uh, I remember a situation where there was a funeral and a lot of Jewish kids went to this Catholic funeral and didn't know anything about communion or any right. of those things that happened there and were uh, quite blown away and not knowing if what they did was right or wrong. You know, what is respectful right. when you're in an, another house of worship? What is acting as if you are of that faith? 
and what is being respectful. Right. And so I think a lot of those things take place in every realm, um, both for the children and for the adults. It seems to me that um, we see more of it. And uh, the, more, the more complex, the more global mm -hmm. our world okay. is. Uh, we have a family at the congregation that I serve that um, we're only seeing the family every other week because the father is a Russian Orthodox um, and the mom, of course, in the family belongs to the United Methodist Church. So the children alternate where they right. go. Um, and it used to be that we would um, award children wonderful little pins for their perfect attendance. And even that is really saying, you know, there's only one way to do this and mm -hmm. one place to be, as opposed to understanding that people um, are balancing and um, live with different different traditions and different influences. And, and as you said, Barbara, mm -hmm. Rabbi Barbara, respecting that and honoring it. So. And, and as you mentioned, you know, in our household, we made the decision before, you know, before we got married, how, how children were gonna, our, our, you know, whatever children we had, this is how they were going to be right. raised religiously. And other households, they sort of decide later, or the, there's the idea of saying, well, we'll expose them to both and th let them choose on their own when they're adults. Uh -huh. And so therefore you might have somebody who is, you know, active active in two congregations right. type of thing or asked to do some level of ritual in both right. congregations. It was, whereas I said, with us, it was, you know, the decision was made ahead of time that, that whoever, whoever showed up in our life was going to be, right. was going to be raised Jewish because and then as Rabbi Barbara pointed out, out yeah. you don't have control over the ultimate decision yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah, and or you may not. That right. we, may, we may present um, children and families with mm -hmm. various options and mm -hmm. um, they still have their own, oh, whoever sure. they are. Whatever That's, exploration mm -hmm. they do as, as adults. But, as adults. Right. But you know, our decision was to send, at least send Franklin in, in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, he, he, he's, he's he asks more questions now, but I don't think it's it's so much theologically based as musically based. Interesting, <laughs> you know, because he's a, he's a singer, and um, we've always had the discussion that you you know you're doesn't matter what the lyrics say, you're not proselytizing, you're performing. You know, a lot of the great huh. masterpieces of music that you will be performing if you are a cl uh, singer were written. You know, they were the church paid for them. Mm -hmm. So, but right now we're doing Messiah. He and mm -hmm. I are doing downtown singers, and so he's been going through the whole thing, checking the uh, the biblical sources of each <laughs> each um, chorus on which is 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 old, you know, shall I say, Old Testament People prophecy uh -huh. prophecy scripture as opposed to actual, you know, right, you know, gospel Not stuff. Gospels. And right. so he's been yeah. doing that. But again, I think it's it's more of a he just wants to know where you know where it all came from, but. <laughs> But I will say, as a Jewish child, growing up in a small town, there were 100 Jewish families and 80,000 people where I grew up. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I didn't know what to do when it came to some of the Christmas carols, and we sang them all at that point in our schools. Oh, yeah. And so right. um, uh, I think I followed somewhat of my mother's guidance, and so there were words I didn't sing. And so I still look, if I'm...